As you're able, I invite you to stand with me as we pray. Merciful God, your Son was lifted up on the cross to draw all people to himself. Grant that we who have been born out of his wounded side may at all times find mercy in him, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. Our first reading is from Isaiah, starting in chapter 52. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told of them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Our responsive reading today is from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of Israel. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. All who see me laugh me to scorn. 
They curl their lips. They shake their heads. Yet you are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. But not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. They open wide their jaws at me, like a slashing and roaring lion. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of death. I can count all my bones while they stare at me and gloat. But you, O Lord, be not far away. O my help, hasten to my aid. Save me from the lion's mouth. From the horns of wild bulls, you have rescued me. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. Our second reading comes from Hebrew, starting in chapter 4. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son... He learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of of eternal salvation for all who obey him. We say the acclamation together. Look to Jesus who for the joy, the joy that was set before him endured the cross.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing, warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, 
Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He enters his headquarters again and asks Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Then Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took the tunic 
Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scriptures, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had come at first to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of Christ. Let us pray. Now may only the truth be spoken, only the truth heard, and only the truth believed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It is very difficult, if not actually impossible, for those of us who've grown up coming to Good Friday services, and I expect most of you here this morning have, to imagine ourselves into being one of the first readers of the gospel, or even more poignantly, one of the disciples, one of the witnesses one of those who actually saw the events we read about. Instead, it's easier for us to anesthetize ourselves against the harshness, the sorrow, and the despair of that first Friday that we call good by looking ahead to Jesus, looking ahead, rather, to Easter Sunday. Some of you might remember the very famous sermon by Tony Campolo that rings with the title, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. I take his point, but it diminishes Friday. 
we can't enter into the joy that we will celebrate in two days' time unless we first into, enter into the despair, the hopelessness, the sheer sense of abandonment that the first followers of Jesus experienced on that first Friday afternoon. So this morning we're going to try. And we're going to try by asking the question, who killed Jesus? Well, the first answer to the question, and it's an answer that the Gospel of John lends itself to, probably too easily, I don't think it was John's intention, but the words are there, is simply, the Jews did. The Jews killed Jesus. John, in particular, among the four Gospels, casts the villains as the Jews, capital T, capital J, without qualification. It seems, though I don't think correctly, but it seems that they're all implicated, according to John, in the murder of the Lord. And this has spawned in our faith the dark history of Christian anti-Semitism. It's very easy for us to blame those people over there, especially when they're different looking, they have different customs and rituals, and they explicitly deny that Jesus is whom we believe him to be. And so throughout the centuries, the Jews killed Jesus has become an excuse for our ancestors to treat the Jews abominably. Well, as time has passed, and we Christians became more enlightened, it became easier for us to say, the mob killed Jesus. The mob who was a crowd of praise on Palm Sunday and who acclaimed Jesus as Messiah, singing Hosanna to the Son of David, bring us salvation now, in other words, to the Son of David. This mob was, by Friday, transformed into the very people who shouted, crucify him. Certainly that's what the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke want us to think. It became clear during that first Holy Week to the crowds who had acclaimed Jesus on Palm Sunday that Jesus was not going to be the king of their expectations, and he made it perfectly clear right away when he turned left and went to the temple instead of turning right and going to kick out the Romans. So maybe the mob killed Jesus. the mob were uneducated, they were unenlightened, they didn't really know what they were doing, they were whipped up in their sentiments by the religious leaders, so maybe we draw the circle a little more narrowly yet and say, among the Jews it was the religious leaders who orchestrated Jesus' death. After all, the Pharisees one sect of first, of, second, of first century Judaism sent their police, as did the chief priests, another sect in first century Judaism. They sent their soldiers, who usually fought with each other, but on this terrible night were united in one purpose. They sent their soldiers to arrest Jesus. Maybe it was the religious leaders Certainly, it was the religious leaders who handed Jesus over to the Romans to be crucified. But maybe we can draw the circle a little more narrowly yet and say it was the disciples. In our reading today, it seems only Peter had an inkling of what was going to happen 
Only Peter had some kind of a half-formed plan to get his Lord out of there and away from the soldiers who were coming to arrest him. And so he whipped out his sword and cut off the ear of this poor fellow, Malchus. Here's a footnote. Have you ever wondered why John gives us the name of the servant? John gives us the name of the servant for the same reason that Mark gives us the name of Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. It's because Marcus and Alexander and Rufus were alive at the time of the writing of these documents, and the authors were asking their readers to go and see if they were telling the truth. But that's a footnote. Jesus is rebuked, sorry, Peter is rebuked by Jesus. And in one gospel telling of this story, he restores poor Malchus's ear. So the way of violence, and the way of spiriting Jesus away from the soldiers imagined by Peter is not going to take place. And as the rest of the story unfolds, Peter denies, Judas betrays, and the scriptures say they all forsook him and fled. In Mark's telling of the story, it seems that Mark ran so fast he ran right out of his clothes and went tearing down the street naked to get away from the soldiers. Was it the Jews? Was it the mob? Was it the religious leaders? Were the disciples themselves implicated? All of those answers are colored over the last 75 years by the terrible event of the Holocaust, and so many Christians have shifted blame from the Jews to the Romans. And again, we begin as broadly as possible. It was the system that killed Jesus. Once the wheels of the system started turning, the outcome was inevitable. Not even Pilate, who wanted to uh, free Jesus, could rescue him from the gears of the machine that the Romans had constructed in first century Judea. That machine was used to killing rebels and upstarts, and criminals and rabble-rousers. And Jesus was at least one of them. And so accused by his own people, however incredible the evidence, once the system had its man, the system would find its evidence. The system would get its outcome. But this doesn't excuse Pilate. Maybe Pilate killed Jesus. Pilate, after all, as he said repeatedly, had the power to set Jesus free. And he never exercised it. The most he ever did was to threaten to use it. Well, maybe, finally, it was only those who were most intimately acquainted with the death of Jesus, namely, the soldiers who actually crucified him. Those soldiers who are stuck in a backwater province of the empire for some misdeed they did, longing to be home, whether home was Spain or home was Italy, or home was Germania, or home was some other Roman province. They didn't want to be where they were, and they were going to take it out on whatever victim the machine handed them. And on this particular Friday, the machine handed them this backwater rabbi named Jesus of Nazareth. And so they played with him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. And they killed him. Who killed Jesus? It's really easy for us to say, those people over there, those people a long time ago, those pagans 
who worshipped foreign gods. Those powerful political appointees who could have used their power to do something different and didn't. Those disciples who abandoned Jesus. Those religious leaders who wanted to preserve their own place in the community. That mob for whom Jesus didn't live up to their expectations. It's always those people over there. And the implied answer when we say those people over there is certainly not us. So when we answer the Jews or the Romans, however we construe those nouns, we distance ourselves from the deed. We say to soothe our own consciences, had we been there, it would have been different. Had we been there with Peter by the charcoal fire, we would not have denied. Had we been there with the twelve at the Last Supper, the devil would not have entered into us as he entered into Judas as he prepared to betray his master. Had we been there with the mobs acclaiming him on Palm Sunday morning, we would not have been with the same mobs when they shouted crucify him on Thursday night and Friday. Had we been there, it would be different. Had we been there, we would have been faithful all the way. Maybe the most courageous among us would even say, had we been there, we wouldn't have watched from a distance like Mary, her sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, and the disciple whom Jesus loved, who only stood far off, had we been there, we would have been right up close. Maybe we would even say, with Thomas and Peter both, we would die with Jesus. But we weren't there. At least that's what we tell ourselves. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes, the old song says, it causes me to tremble. Were you there? B.B. King and Bono in the song, When Love Comes to Town, answers that question in words we might not like. I was there when they crucified my Lord. I stood by when the soldier drew his sword. I was there when they pierced his side. I was there. And so were you. And there's no manner of psychological distancing, there's no manner of blame shifting that gets us off the hook. We were all there, and we were all in on it. The Christian tradition here says something much stronger than, had we been there, it still would have happened like that. Though that's true. The Christian tradition says, actually, we were there. We were all there. And when the Gospel writers tell us, all the disciples forsook him and fled, they mean just that. All. And that includes me. I was there. And so were you. We were all in on it. We all crucified the Lord of glory. There's no getting off this hook. There's no getting away from it. 
And the only route to Easter Sunday is a route that starts here. Who killed Jesus? None other and nothing else than me and my sin. Amen.
As you are able, I invite you please to stand. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the Church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith. Proclaim your name and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for our bishops, for our pastors, for our deacons, and for all the servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church, and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for God's creation.
Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, and freedom, and share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick. Comfort the dying. Give safety to travelers. Free those unjustly deprived of liberty and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things which our Lord would have us ask as we pray together as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Behold the life-giving cross on which hung the Savior of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Down the Via Dorado 
upon his back, and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head, and he bore with every step the scorn of all to cry. Giving cross on which hung the Savior of the whole world.
You are welcome to remain seated for the solemn reproaches, though if you are able, I would invite you to kneel. O my people, O my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you through the desert forty years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. What more could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you my chosen and fairest vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys of the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. My peace I gave which the world cannot give and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offer you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, Holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. 
I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Our sending hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. (laughs) 